Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to Cloud Native Live, uh, where we dive into the code behind Cloud Native. I'm Annie Talvasta, and I'm a CNC ambassador as well as a product marketing manager at Camunda, and I will be your host tonight. So, every week we bring a new set of presenters or presenter to showcase how to work with Cloud Native technologies, and they will build things, they will break things, and they will answer your questions. Uh, join us every Wednesday to watch live. So this week we have a great presenter and amazing content coming up. We have Ben Morrison here to talk to us about Eagle Core to Edge mobility and resiliency for cloud native applications. And as a housekeeping, as always, this is an official live stream of the CNCF and as such, it is subject to the CNCF code of conduct. So please do not add anything to the chat or questions that would be in violation of that code of conduct. Basically, in a nutshell, Please be respectful of all of your fellow participants as well as the presenter. So with that, uh, I'll hand it over to Ben to kick off today's presentation. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having us, uh, CNCF. We always enjoy uh, working together with our partnerships. So today uh, we'll be talking about how to improve cloud native mobility and resiliency with core to edge capabilities. Uh, as Emmy said, my name is Ben Morrison. I'm a solutions architect here at Trilio, and uh, we'll go ahead and dive right into it. And so here to start off um, in terms of core to edge uh, in the cloud native challenge. Uh, so when it, when it comes to core to edge, organizations are mostly turning towards this architecture method with cloud native applications for a variety of reasons, but it really boils down to essentially wanting to have those actionable insights and to improve services for their customers and improve that customer experience. So at the core of what some of this consists of would be mobility of that data across the core to the edge and all of those uh, all of those components sitting, all of those IoT components sitting on the edge, improving those IT operations that are actually happening on the edge. This is a big piece in terms of why people are moving towards K3S and other uh, Kubernetes functionalities to uh, operate their edge uh, applications. And then on top of that, an, an important part of this architecture is the resiliency in two different forms here. One being the resiliency of the infrastructure and security, especially when it comes to ransomware protection or malware protection. And then also the uh, edge cloud resiliency, keeping that resiliency of your actual applications up and running on the edge. So real quickly, some statistics here about the challenges of Kubernetes and users moving towards this cloud native methodology of Kubernetes itself. So on the left hand side, we have some statistics of a survey that was taken actually all the way back in 2017. And the reason why we show this is because uh, the storage component is what we really want to look at here when it comes to stateless applications running on the edge with Kubernetes and stateful applications. And so all the way back in 2017, uh, users reported a top challenge, uh, of course, their number one challenge being security and, and caution of those ransomware and malware attacks, but then also the uh, concern of storage itself, those stateful applications running on the edge or in their Kubernetes clusters instead of just stateless. So already back in 2017, indicating a trend towards those stateful applications running on Kubernetes. And now we know, of course, with any new adoption of any new technology, especially when it comes to infrastructure and architecture, we always start off with those stateless applications, but start to move towards stateful. We saw the same thing here with Kubernetes. At first, early adopters were all running stateless applications without any of that data actually on their Kubernetes cluster or on their edge clusters. And now we're finding that users are moving more towards those stateful applications, just sort of setting uh, setting the theme for the conversation today. And so on the right hand side, we have a CNCF survey, which is from 2020, I believe it is. And I know CNCF will be coming out with a new one, a uh, new survey sometime soon. So this uh, data on the right is about a year old, but even here about a year ago, we can see that over half of Kubernetes users did run or were running stateful applications in their clusters. 
Um, 22% were not, they were only running stateless, but we also found that 12% were evaluating stateful applications and 11% were planning to move towards stateful applications in the next 12 months. So here, just again, setting the stage for how to ensure those stateful applications are being appropriately migrated from core to cluster and making sure we have that resiliency across core to cluster in, in our migration scenarios. So here, just to paint a picture of the personas that all manage those cloud native applications, we have a variety of characters here, Lisa, Brian, Rob, and Jane. Uh, Lisa is a developer, more of that high-end manager type. And we have then Brian, a, a um, SRE, that is more responsible for making sure the apps run successfully and monitoring those applications. We have Rob, who is more on the ops side and also a bit of an SRE, and then Jane, who is strictly on the ops side. And so the reason why we want to go over this in terms of the variety of personas is because that is one of the huge advantages of Kubernetes, right, is the namespaces and the ability for so many different personas to access your cluster all over the world. Uh, at the same time, though, that does pose challenges at the same time. So in terms of security, every single individual that's interacting with a Kubernetes cluster or a certain namespace or a certain application or workload, that poses another avenue of security risk with another person touch basing with that Kubernetes cluster. On top of that, it also requires a lot of organization and management uh, at a granular level of the applications running in those clusters and on the edge. And so essentially just getting at the theme of the security and the granularity that we need to make sure we're managing when talking about migrating from core to edge. So here, when we look at core to edge in terms of how it comes to Kubernetes, one example we have here, just there's a variety of edge computing you can use to run those applications at the edge. But one example here would be a Rancher K3S which is actually uh, the edge cluster we're gonna be using in a demo today. Then we have the Rancher RKE, a core cluster. Uh, today for our demo, we'll actually be using EKS, but here in our example, we have Rancher. And then the connection to AWS, to the cloud itself. So just outlining that architecture of connecting and migrating that data from K3S to core and connecting it through the cloud itself. And the main characteristics, again, you wanna worry about or be aware of, when it comes to this migration architecture is the resiliency of those applications, the mobility of those applications and the data curation at that granular level. So when it comes to resiliency, as I mentioned, there was two different pieces. The first one being security. So we wanna make sure we are aware of uh, any security pieces, especially when it comes to ransomware and malware. So today we'll be talking about uh, two, two core, I'd say the two most important aspects of that security piece when moving cloud data data cloud native excuse me cloud native data from uh, core to edge that first piece would be the immutability and the second very important piece would be encryption itself and then secondly you also want to think about your granular application control when moving that, those workloads back and forth. Of course, those edge clusters are usually much smaller than, than the core or any other typical uh, Kubernetes cluster. And so we wanna make sure that we have consistent support from edge to core. We also wanna make sure that we uh, have enhanced cloud migration capabilities. And then lastly, have any granular application capture to keep at that granular level in, in mitigating what actually goes to the edge and what does not. Perfect. There was actually an audience question. I think that would be sure. super helpful to take right now. So Finn Yusuf asks, different people have different understanding of stateless and stateful applications. Can you please mm -hmm. give us an understanding of both technologies? Um, you kind of bit mentioned it, but maybe go a bit deeper so that, that we're all in the same uh, field. Sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. And please feel free to interrupt me uh, further with any questions and clarifications like that as we go along as well. I want to make sure everyone uh, is on the same page as we go through this. So stateless is defined as uh, an application that does not store data on the Kubernetes cluster itself. It's mostly service-based. It does not store any cluster, any data in a persistent volume uh, in any sort of way, whereas stateful is either that ephemeral or, or persistent data sitting in the cluster itself. Some, some sort of storage 
of data within a persistent volume. So an easy way to think about this would be stateful uses a database. It uses MySQL, MongoDB, Cassandra, any of the databases out there. Stateless would not require a, data, a database at all. There's no data that needs to be stored with stateless. Perfect, thank you so much. And thank you so much to Femi Yusuf for the question. Keep them coming. Absolutely, yep, great question. So moving on here, the first piece we're gonna talk about under the security aspect uh, is going to be ransomware. So uh, as many I'm sure probably know at this point, as the conversations of ransomware have constantly been increasing in the past year or two, especially during the pandemic. But just to go over the exact definition, uh, ransomware attacks are defined as a cybersecurity attack where a malicious actor or an organization gains access to an organization's software uh, and encrypts it and then holds it for ransom. So obviously a situation that we've heard of before, we've heard of many of those ransomware attacks happening over the past couple of years. And so right now from statistics we gathered from 2021, we found that there is on average about 300 million cases of ransomware attacks happening each year and probably projected to grow as we continue in the future. There's no guarantee with these ransomware attacks that the attacker or the malicious actor will actually unlock that data. So people need to, organizations need to make sure that they have a contingency plan, some sort of plan for uh, how to recover after a ransomware attack, especially when it comes to data moving across the core and the edge itself, which we'll get a bit more into here. Uh, the average cost of a single ransomware attack has increased by 171% from last year to this year. And so it is now an average cost of 300,000 approximately, just over $300,000. And that attack has increased, uh, those attacks have increased 72% uh, during the pandemic itself. And here, especially this last piece, I think is gonna pertain towards that core to edge architecture in terms of the increased access to business data over mobile devices uh, has increased vulnerabilities by 50%. And that especially is relevant for our core to edge cases, right? Because we have so many more devices out there on the edge. We have so much more data going over our networks and we need to make sure that those vulnerabilities are secured as best as they can be. And so that's some of what we'll be talking about today, how you could use Trilio or any other solution like Trilio uh, to make sure you have that ransomware security. So there's a few different ways organizations have uh, been going about combating ransomware, but the two uh, major institutions out there in terms of building best practices and the two most internationally recognized institutions would be NIST, National Security of Standards and Technology, and then NCCOE, the National Cybersecurity Center of Excellence. And so this is a good rule of thumb if you've not heard of either of these two organizations, there'd be uh, best practices to follow their guidance in terms of how to protect your core to edge architecture against ransomware attacks. And so ransomware protection is obviously more than just a single feature. It's an entire strategy, an entire comprehensive approach to how to protect against ransomware and then also recover from a ransomware attack. And so, um, as I said before, many organizations, Trilio included, has chosen to follow the NIST and NCCOE uh, solutions in terms of best practices for going about protecting against ransomware. And what we have found on our end is that essentially these two main frameworks, the main components boil down to three categories. First one being identify and protect, the second one being detect and mitigate, and then lastly being recover. Uh, just to go more in depth with those that identify and protect would be searching uh, and looking for any vulnerabilities within your system itself. Detecting and mitigating would be detecting any uh, malicious actors, any malware, any ransomware within your core to edge architecture. And then the recoverability would be after an attack itself has occurred, having some contingency plan, having some plan to recover that data and not have to pay your ransom or pay the ransom itself. Uh, also to align with this, Gardner has recently come out with a report that you can look up that I think we'll be able to share in the chat or uh, in the banner itself at some point here during the presentation. You can also Google it yourself, how to prepare for ransomware attacks. And here, even Gardner, you can see in the abstract, 
is outlining a pre-incident preparation strategy, uh, a strategy you need to have to identify ransomware attacks are happening, that second piece, the identify piece. And then that third piece, training for all staff for a post-incident response and even scheduling drills is what Gardner recommends here. And so part of that post-incident response would be something like recovering your data using some sort of backup recovery solution such as Trilio. Another important note to think about when thinking about your architecture of migrating from edge to core or core to edge would be that zero trust architecture, which essentially uh, we define as a strategic initiative that is really rooted in the principle of never trust, always verify, uh, which essentially means that you are constantly requiring the authentication of all users within a Kubernetes cluster and application. Remember that image we had at the beginning of the presentation. So all four of those users would have that constant authentication. And then also constantly validating the security of all possible vulnerable points within your system as well. So getting a little more depth into this cloud native challenge of ransomware and security when, when looking at uh, edge to uh, core architectures, you have two different components here, two entries of attack where, where you want to make sure your security is handled. First would be the Kubernetes management console itself. Uh, as you can imagine, you have to have security software to make sure that you're identifying and protecting against any sort of cybersecurity attack. And then secondly, would also be that storage media, that target or third-party external uh, storage, whether it be S3 or NFS, where you have backups stored. For in case the event of a ransomware attack happens, you want to make sure that those backups are secured and safe and um, that you can rely on them to be properly restored and then not have to pay that ransom itself. And so with that, that will get into the encryption and uh, immutability pieces we're going to talk about. This here is a, is a variety of features that Trilio has instigated, and I know Many of the other backup and recovery solutions out there have uh, some pieces of these features themselves. But for Trilio, we, we took this security piece very, very seriously, especially as we see an increase of stateful applications in Kubernetes and an increase of use of uh, cluster, uh, core to edge migration using Kubernetes. So this is a variety of the features that we outlined in our solution that align to that identify and protect, detect and mitigate, and that final recover piece. The two main ones I want to talk about would be backup immutability on that identify and protect piece and the encryption piece as well, getting to that core protection. So when, when talking about a uh, backup solution for recovering in the event of ransomware attacks, you, you want to make sure that you have the backup immutability piece. So not just immutability of an entire target, like an entire S3 bucket, but very granular immutability. So you can go in and make each individual backup plan of each individual workload you have moving across your core to edge environment, uh, making sure that each individual one is actually immutable. So when you get to that granular level, you can not only save costs because causing a uh, having a backup be immutable creates more storage within an S3 target. And so you can minimize your cost by getting more granular, but you also have individual keys to that immutability. Instead of an entire uh, S3 bucket being immutable, each individual backup plan is immutable. And the same piece goes for encryption as well. One, you can get more granular and be more cost effective. So instead of encrypting everything within an S3 storage target, you can encrypt down to the backup level and select what you want to encrypt and what you do not, essentially selecting what is the most mission critical data and which is not. And then secondly, having that backup level encryption means that you have a essentially a different key. You have a different encryption key to every single backup itself. So if a malicious actor were to try to attack these backups uh, and maybe get into the S3 target itself, they find that each individual backup is also encrypted, adding to that another level of, of security for your for your backups themselves. Now getting more into that granular workload protection piece, we talked about the security before and the importance of security when it comes to core to edge uh, migration and core to edge architectures. Secondly, we have that granular workload protection you want to talk about. So you want to make sure that you are able to protect your applications at the namespace level. So you can migrate entire namespaces or if you have any data loss when transferring data 
from core to edge that you have an entire namespace backed up itself. Um, beyond namespaces alone, we uh, at Trilio, we actually have added extra functionality in terms of application backup itself. And so uh, we, you can back up based on Helm operator labels and you can select which Helms and operators you want to back up within a certain namespace itself. So again, getting very, very granular, I'm sure, especially with the labels piece, uh, many of us are familiar with labels and, and keeping them organized with our workloads themselves. And so you wanna make sure you have a backup solution that allows you to select individual labels to get to that granular level. Uh, and I did see there's a question. Go ahead, yeah. question there. Uh, how, yeah, there's a question. How do you secure the encryption piece? Sure. So the encryption keys themselves, I might have to follow up on the exact framework we look at in terms of the encryption piece. But essentially through Trilio, what we do is we utilize the S3 target encryption capabilities. From there, we've been able to slice it down essentially so you can encrypt at that backup level. But the answer to that would be essentially it relies heavily on the S3 target you're using and how you choose to protect those encryption keys through that S3 target itself. We are simply utilizing that functionality of the S3 target you choose to use. So I hope that answers the question. It relies mostly on the S3 target itself when it comes to the encryption keys. Great, I hope it did. And if not, then you just let us know and, and we can then <laughs> take it from there as well. Thank you so much for the question, Dan. Yep, absolutely, thank you. Uh, and then the last piece when it comes to granular workload protection. Uh, would be that migration workflow piece as well. Uh, with Trilio, we've designed a disaster recovery slash migration tool to quickly pull applications from one cluster into another cluster, which would be that easy way that you can actually perform that migration itself. With a tool like Trilio, you're performing that migration through your target, through your S3 bucket or NFS storage. And so essentially you would do a capture of a backup of an application running in the core, for example, then that backup would be stored on your S3 or, or NFS, and then you could recover it to your K3S edge cluster, which is actually the demo that we're gonna be doing today. And so having that workflow piece, some sort of tool where you're able to easily have minimal clicks to restore a backup from the core into K3S is the format that you want to have. In the demo today, we're gonna to be showing how to do that migration piece, but I'll also note that um, if you have more questions about Trilio specifically, we do have newer versions available now uh, that have since come out more recently that do have that specific disaster recovery tool in it. Then secondly, we wanna talk about enhanced cloud migration features. And so as you can imagine, when you're migrating applications from the core to the edge, you're likely using just different distributions. You have very different clusters that you're migrating from. You're probably not gonna have a homogenous system when it comes to those two different clusters. And so we've included something called restore transforms, uh, inclusions, and then also exclusions. First piece there, the restore transforms is, is really neat and it definitely uh, is very essential for this core to edge migration. What you can do with these transforms is actually change the metadata itself of an application before it's restored into the edge environment. So for example, if the core cluster and your edge clusters are using two different storage classes, you can use a transform to go in and change the metadata before you pull that back up into the uh, edge cluster and change that storage class itself before it's restored into the edge cluster. For inclusions and hooks, or, or excuse me, for inclusions and exclusions, this help, just helps you get very granular. So this means that once you do a backup of, let's say, an entire namespace on your core cluster, but you do not want to restore the entire namespace to your edge cluster, you can get very granular to include certain components and exclude certain components so that you're really um, optimizing your usage of that edge cluster. Because I said before, it's gonna be a significantly smaller size and you're probably not gonna be able to run everything that's on the core, or you shouldn't be able to run everything that's on the core. Then secondly here, when we talk about these uh, migration features, we have hooks as well. Uh, at Trilio, we, we use pre and post hooks for before and after a backup occurs, which allows you to essentially execute any command that you need to before and after that backup actually takes place. And so this especially gets into databases 
and properly quiescing a database to make sure it's in a capturable state. But it can also be used to have any other sort of system integration or automation within your system itself. So you can utilize these hooks and input commands however you wish. And then our last piece here, I believe is the last one, is that application consistent support. And so you want to make sure uh, you have application consistent backups through those hooks themselves, as I was just mentioning, that quiescing of the database. Uh, in terms of Trilio, our database support is very extensive. It's actually more than what's listed here. The, these databases you see listed here are just examples we have in our documentation. Uh, if you want to take a look at one these hooks would look like, we have Cassandra, MongoDB, MySQL, MariaDB, et cetera, all of these examples uh, in our documentation. But the nice thing about hooks is that it's very easy to become compatible with any of those databases out there. So I personally have rarely ever seen an issue where uh, we didn't have database support with Trilio. And so make sure that your backup solution is compatible with whatever uh, database you are using. Okay, and then I think we're going to switch to our uh, recorded demo here. Um, I, I'll i pretty much play this all the way through. I'm going to talk through the demo itself. Because it's a core to edge migration, you know, we wanted to capture this beforehand to make sure everything was smooth. And so what we're doing here is we are um, going to be migrating uh, an application, a WordPress application from our primary cluster, which is an EKS cluster. You can see in the URL up at the top and migrating that WordPress backup to our K3S cluster. The primary cluster is EKS, as I mentioned, the K3S cluster is a rancher cluster. So here we're looking at that admin view. We're looking at uh, the multi-cluster management and the Trilio UI showing both of those clusters, but we're going to move to just the K3S cluster for the sake of this demo. Pretty much uh, simulating what it would be like to be a user with only permissions to that K3S cluster, along with permissions to the target itself to grab that backup and what that, what that piece would look like. So here in our K3S cluster, you can see again that URL at the top, we changed windows and are, we are now in that Rancher K3S cluster. Uh, we can see some application discovery in the middle. This is essentially just showing all of our namespaces and showing what is protected and what is not protected on this cluster. So right now, oh, let's just switching over real quickly there. And then we'll go back here. There we are. Okay, we're back here at the K3S cluster, just showing our namespaces themselves, what's protected, what's not protected. And this is a fresh K3S cluster. So as you can see, there's really no applications running here. There's no backups that have occurred, but we do have that restore uh, NS3 namespace, which is where we're gonna be restoring our WordPress application from, again, migrating from the core into this K3S cluster. So to do that, we're going to take a look at our resource management tab and move, oh, I'm gonna go back there for a second. Let's see if I can capture that. I know the video speeds here. What we're doing is we're gonna be looking into, here we go. We're gonna be looking into our target browser itself. So, here, what we did is we connected our S3 bucket, that target I mentioned, where we're going to be going through, going core to S3 target to K3S edge cluster. So here, what we've already done is we've done that backup from the core to the S3 target piece. We have our target here, demo S3 target, where that backup is stored of our WordPress application that was originally in the core. And now we're going to launch a target browser. So from this window, what we're doing is we are looking into the target browser, looking at that backup that was taken from the core cluster, and then we're going to be restoring it into the K3S cluster running on the edge. So here going into that target browser, we can see uh, an AngelBeat backup plan, which is where this backup occurred. Uh, again, backing up that WordPress application from the core. So here looking at this backup, we can see our WordPress backup sitting here. It was taken some time ago, and we can go ahead and uh, restore that backup into our current cluster, the K3S, right from this window here. So we're going to simply name that restore, restore1234, and then find that restore namespace we want to get into. 
So bringing that entire namespace into the restore NS3 namespace of our K3S cluster. Here we're flagging uh, skip if already exists. This is just a variety of flags that we offer in terms of, let me go back there just to check on that. A variety of flags that we offer just to get again, very granular. Uh, would this skip if already exists? As you can imagine, if an object already exists on that K3S cluster that Trilio is trying to restore, Trilio will know then to just skip that object entirely to not have duplicates of that object. As, again, uh, making sure you're optimizing and very, being, being very conservative with the space in the, in the uh, workloads that you have running on your K3S cluster. You can also, of course, have patch if already exists or omit data as we talked about some of those exclusions themselves. Here then we have our transforms. You'll see transforms, exclusions, and hooks that we just talked about. The transforms is the most interesting piece here. So we'll go over how to make a transform and actually changing that metadata. So in our original application, our WordPress application on the core EKS cluster, we were using a storage class of EBSSC. And we'll show that at the end of this video here as well. But in our K3S cluster, we're using a different storage class. So what we need to do in our K3S cluster before we restore it is go in and select the objects we want to alter. We'll do a replace operation and selecting the path of spec storage class name to change the actual name of the storage class this application is going to use. And then change that application, or excuse me, change that name of the storage class to CSI host path SC. So now when that backup is restored, our WordPress application is migrated to K3S. Automatically, right from the get-go, it's going to know to, to use the CSI host path SC storage class instead of the EBS storage class. Here we're just making sure it was properly saved. And once that transform is saved, it can of course be reused over and over again. So you don't have to worry about recreating and figuring out the paths to change those storage class. Once it's saved, you'll have it uh, forever on your uh, um, instance of TVK. And now here we're just gonna go back and monitor that uh, this restore process itself. So at this point, it'll take about four minutes for this restore to occur. Uh, so if there are any other questions, I encourage everyone to drop those in the chat now and we can have some open discussion about some of what we've seen so far. Uh, if there are no questions, I can of course skip ahead since this is recorded, uh, but would like to take some time for questions if need be. So I'll go ahead and keep an eye on the chat if anyone wants to ask any of those questions. Uh, while we wait for people to hopefully type in uh, all of those questions, mm -hmm. I would have one. Uh, why is it important to implement effective application mobility and resiliency for cloud native applications, actually? Why is it important to implement security and resiliency for those cloud native mm, applications? Yeah. Was that the question? Yeah. So this, right. So the security piece as we talked about, it's, uh, it's one of those instances that's like the insurance policy, right? You, you want to make sure that you are protected. You hope nothing ever happens, but in the event that something does happen, you want to make sure you are secured in terms of having a backup to restore your data. And as we talked about, especially with core to edge architectures, you have a lot more vulnerabilities uh, because you have a lot more mobile clusters running out there. And so you really wanna make sure that you're prioritizing security. And then secondly, that granular approach as we've talked a bit about, when you're, when you're migrating applications and workloads across different clusters, you're gonna have a lot of differences between those clusters. You have differences of size and what they can actually manage. And so it's really important to stay organized on that granular level in terms of only migrating the pieces that you need to migrate. Uh, so that's really what you know solutions like Trilio are offering here in terms of a backup and migration solution all in one. So as you're backing up those applications in the core from that backup in your S3 or NFS target storage, you can restore those backups into multiple edge clusters and you can get very granular in how you restore them as well so all in one process you're getting a little bit of the security and a little bit of the migration granularity all in one tool here okay. is there any downtime associated with a backup and migration process i'm seeing that now uh, so the answer is no so hooks are sometimes needed to put databases in a capturable state uh, but essentially there's, there is no downtime when using a tool like Trilio because of those hooks, you could say that maybe, um, extra resources are being used on the cluster. So 
resource optimization won't be at its peak, but there will not be any downtime when it comes to that migration piece on either the core or the edge. Any other questions we have here? We have a few more times we can see. We can see the target validation has occurred. We've had validation of the backup itself, just ensuring that it is a healthy backup. Uh, it looks like now that data restore process is occurring. So currently it's restoring that uh, WordPress application into our K3S edge cluster. Another question came in. So do you buffer the transactions and play it back later? Um, could you elaborate a little bit more on that question? I'm not sure what you're exactly what you're asking there with the buffering transactions and playing it back later. Yes, let's see. Let me, uh, Lisa, would you like to um, clarify a bit so that we can answer you in the best possible way? And while we're waiting for um, clarifications or more questions, obviously, anyone, uh, if you have any questions, leave them here. We have still time to get to them as well. Um, is mm -hmm. there any more um, happening in the demo at the moment while we wait for the, the questions for clarification? While we wait there, I'll go ahead and just skip ahead here uh, so we can get to the end of this restore. Uh, so it seems like we don't have too many questions coming through the chat. But the ones so, that have come have been really great. Thank you so much to everyone. That's, that's why, uh, yes. Thank you, thank you. So here um, we can see just fast forwarding a little bit that our restore process is complete took about looks like six seven minutes to complete here uh going through that data restore process and the metadata restore as well that's part of trilio's functionality is we capture both the metadata and the data itself uh because of course you would need both in order to migrate and run those workloads across different clusters here we can see a resource summary and a metadata summary we can look at the exact uh, metadata and here we're looking at our persistent volume claim and we can see that in this restore process, we successfully restored the WordPress application using CSI HostPath SC as the storage class. Now, just to uh, confirm that part of this, uh, um, uh, um, my, excuse me, I've lost my speaking there. Part of this restore process, changing that storage class itself, we're going to go back into the original backup plan. Here, we're back at AngelBeat plan. Working, looking again at the original WordPress backup that we pulled this from. And we can see here that this storage class is that EBS SC. So just showing again that as you back up your core applications, you can migrate them across those different edge clusters and still alter the data itself, alter the metadata of the application itself before it's restored to make sure that that restore ha process happens smoothly. Again, gain into that all-in-one security and granular migration feature here. Perfect. So let's see, we have another one other question. Yeah. yeah, the question goes, I presume the system is being used while the migration slash backup is being done. How do you ensure that in-flight data that hasn't been, hasn't been persisted to the source makes it to the destination? Gotcha. Okay, that, that definitely clarifies it. Thank you for that clarification. So first off the in terms of um the system running while that migration and backup is being done what trilio does is when it captures that application to do the migration it uses uh csi snapshotting capabilities to take a quick snapshot of that application itself and capture the data as it sits at that nanosecond of the snapshot itself it captures the data as it sits and backs that up to then be migrated. If you use hooks in your backup process, then you can make sure, however you customize those hooks, that those that database and that data you're capturing is in an application consistent format, that you are uh, not backing up data that's partly complete, that's partial data, that you're backing up all complete data, however you need to have it quiesced for your system itself. 
Um, and then the later part of that question in terms of how to ensure that in-flight data that hasn't been persisted uh, to the destinations makes it to the destination source. So in terms of migration, this would be a migration component for um, data that doesn't have as many um, um, IOPS going on per se, because once you capture that data, then you would restore it into your edge cluster. And of course, if that backup and restore process takes 10, 15, 20 minutes, whatever it be, then you would have a lag from your data there between your edge and your core itself. Now, that being said, that's how Trilio stands now in terms of backup and restore. What we're in the process of doing with a new release coming out um, in the next six months or so is a continuous restore feature, meaning that essentially as those backups are occurring from your core environment, your core cluster, going through the S3 target itself, and then it would be continuously restored on your edge cluster. So you have a much more minimal, almost near zero time in between uh, that, that backup and that restore happening itself because it's more of a continuous process that's occurring. So I know that was a bit wordy there for that question, but um, at the core of the answers there would be, one, you can use hooks to make sure your uh, applications are in a backupable process for before that backup occurs or while that backup occurs. And two, once that backup and restore occurs, you would see a little bit of a lag in terms of uh, data uh, consistency in terms of a couple uh, minutes or a couple hours, however long that process takes. Uh, but beyond that, we will have features in the future to minimize that time of the difference of data as much as possible. So I, that concludes my demo itself that I wanted to show today. Uh, I think hopefully we also got those two links dropped in the chat at some point. Uh, we had one link about a Trilio blog that we came out with talking about edge to core, excuse me, core to edge or vice versa, migrations using Trilio. And then there was another post in there, which was the Gardner report. We wanted to make sure we shared with the audience as well. Yes, and if not, we are going to post them around now so everyone can get to the links and uh, get started on learning more and, and diving deeper into these really important topics. Yeah, Absolutely. great. Um, yeah, and thank you. Uh, there was a thank you for the clarification. Uh, very wordy, but I think wordy is good as far as uh, wordy is good. answering questions go. Yeah, for sure. Um, and now, uh, thank you so much for the great presentation and the demo. So now we have a bit of time for the Q&A portion as well. Not that we haven't gone through Q&A during this um, session already. Um, mm -hmm. But now that we're kicking that off, everyone obviously just, you know, keep questions coming, comments and anything. We're super happy to hear from you. That's why we are here. Uh, thank you for the question so far. But to kick it off, um, thank you so much for the general things and everything. But then if we go a bit further, I guess, how does application mobility and resiliency improve IT operations at the edge than in general? Sure. So that application mobility and resiliency piece, uh, improving those IT operations. Um, obviously, you want your applications to be as up to date as possible. And you want, a, first and foremost, you want a very easy and automated process for moving those applications, for migrating those applications. Um, if you don't get those workloads on the edge itself, then there's not much to operate when it comes to IT operations. So that's really at the core of what we've been uh, striving for here at Trilio is having that backup and then also the migration piece uh, as being as automated and um, as minimal headaches as possible. You know, I mean, Kubernetes is obviously really grown in the past couple of years, as we've seen, as CNCF has seen, and everyone here has seen. And so the part of that is constantly, constantly developing those new tools to be able to make all of these processes, such as migration, as smooth as possible. So this is our approach, uh, and I'd be curious to see any other approaches out there as well. Perfect. Wonderful. Um, so another question from my side, uh, what is an effective way to protect and migrate workloads between core and edge using Kubernetes? Right, so that uh, protect and migrate question there, that would be um, at the core of what a tool like Trilio would do. Because you can now be using with cloud native applications, you can not only, um, you can not only back up those applications using the same tool, but you can migrate those applications using the same tool. So there's a variety of other backup solutions out there. Uh, this is the Trilio approach 
of how we go about that piece. But um, essentially, now you can know that you can have one tool to do both the migrations and the backups themselves. Perfect. That's always nice. So now that we have seen kind of uh, what's the current best practices and state of, of core to edge mobility and resiliency, how do you see this space going, growing in the future? What's kind of in the, what does the roadmap hold for Twilio or mm -hmm. what, what will the kind of space um, have coming up in the future as well? Yep, absolutely. I, that's a great question. I love that question. So as we are, saw a little bit in the beginning of our talk here today, those industry trends increasing when it comes to workloads being put on Kubernetes clusters themselves. Uh, as we all know, you know, Kubernetes is quickly being adopted at a very rapid and steady state. And so I'm sure that that core to edge and edge computing and edge clusters are going to be a huge part of that. That's actually one of the biggest advantages of Kubernetes that people tend to talk about in the community. And so I'm assuming and, and expecting and excited to see that uh, those edge clusters and those edge migration pieces growing a lot in the future. Perfect. And now we've had the links shared um, to the chat so everyone can get uh, learning more as well. Is there any other kind of material if someone's getting into this space that they should look into or, or for beginner or advanced material that you recommend usually to people to start learning? Sure, great question. So both of these two links would be a great place to start. Uh, the first one is that Gardner report that I mentioned briefly, talking about essentially uh, how you should go about protecting your environments and your especially core to edge architectures against any ransomware attacks. So that would be a great place to start just to know it might not be the direction you think that, that needs to be addressed, but it's definitely, you know, security is day one. And so that's something that needs to be addressed immediately when thinking about your core to edge architectures. And then secondly, you can start off with that blog uh, that Trilio has posted talking about using a tool like like Trilio Vault for Kubernetes uh, to, to go about those core to edge uh, migration. So that would be an excellent place to start as well. Uh, beyond that, if you want to learn more about Trilio specifically, you go to docs.trilio.io. Uh, but besides that, uh, the, the Gardner report especially would be an excellent place to start. Or I would also say visiting uh, some of those NIST or NCCOA, NCCOE websites as well. Perfect. A lot of deep dives going to happen after this uh, to the materials for sure. Um, so I think this is the final call. Um, Maybe not the but we would have some time still the final call if you have any questions comments anyone please keep them coming and so forth um but then do you have any final words or kind of conclusion or anything else to 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 add now more um i have i have nothing else on my end um uh thank you everyone for coming and attending today talking about uh core to edge mobility and everything that goes around core to edge. Uh, I know it's obviously a lot and there could be some things here that maybe we're not, uh, you may not have thought of as being a top priority for that mobility and resiliency, but uh, these are you know, the two aspects that we think are the most important when, when looking at that mobility and resiliency, security and granularity. That's what it really comes down to. And so um, from that, I would say thank you for everyone. I don't think we have too many more questions here, but if there are any more, we can wait around and see as well. Yeah, for sure. Uh, maybe from my side, final question, if there's any any question being written here. Um, so you mentioned Helm as a, as a great CNCF project to 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 use as well, and then and kind of went a bit, bit deeper into there. Is there any other CNCF projects, either sandbox incubating or graduated, that you would like to kind of recommend in this space or see as a good complementary um, to work with Twilio as well? Um, I would definitely say Helm would be the top one. I can't, I'm not thinking of any others that are coming to the top of my head now, but I'd be happy to follow up maybe an email. If we can think of some other um, CNCF projects out there that are complementary with Trilio, but Helm would be the biggest one. And Helm, we also wanted to prioritize as having those Helm-based backups um, because we see such heavy adoption of Helm charts. The majority of organizations we talk to, DevOps or SREs or IT ops, teams are using Helm charts to deploy their applications on Kubernetes. Um, I personally use them all the time, and I think it's the smoothest to go about deploying those applications. And so we wanted to make sure that you could migrate 
replicate your actual Helm chart itself along with the application. So um, to clarify some of that, I'm not sure actually I covered this as much during the talk, so this is a great question. When Trilio goes about capturing a Helm chart, not only do we capture all of the metadata and data of the application associated with that Helm chart, every every object needed to run that application we capture, but also we capture the Helm chart itself and all revisions of the Helm chart itself. So when you're restoring a Helm chart from one cluster to another, you're getting the application exactly as it was running before in that point in time that it was captured, and you're also getting all revisions of that Helm chart itself. So um, our compatibility with Helm charts very uh, has a lot of depth to it, and we did that for a reason because we see a lot of adoption of Helm charts in Kubernetes. Techno Helm is absolutely wonderful. I always recommend people to use it as well. So it's a great, yeah. <laughs> great complementary thing for sure. But yeah, since no new questions has popped in, we did handle a lot of questions during the presentation as well. Um, so we've been busy with the Q&A during and after here. Um, so let's, yeah. I will start wrapping things up uh, for today. So thank you everyone for joining the latest episode of Cloud Native Live. It's been a pleasure. It's been great having Ben Mar Morrison talking about improved core to edge mobility and resiliency for cloud native applications. Um, we, I have to say that I really love the interaction from, and the question from the audience. We um, tackled many good clarifications as well. And as always, uh, tune in next week as well, because we bring you the latest cloud native code every Wednesday as well. Um, there's actually a final question. I think we can take it before I wrap things up with the final words. So is there a simple way to create a test set to experiment with these processes? Uh, absolutely. If you want to experiment with, um, I mean, I can always speak to Trilio and our approach to migration. If you want to experiment with Trilio, uh, we have free trials you could download. Uh, and then beyond that, just any other cluster, any cluster that you have available. I know there's a lot of free trials out there to spin up a GKE cluster or anything. Um, and they also have Minikube as well. You could, uh, you, I've, I've installed a Minikube cluster on my personal computer itself or any any computer that you have, you can install Minikube onto and start testing out um, those migration capabilities. If you had two, of course, two different Minikube clusters. So that would be my recommendation is look into Minikube, look into some free trials for clusters themselves, get two of them spun up however you can, and then get a tool like Trilio to then take a backup and restore uh, applications across those clusters to, to test that migration piece. Great question there. Perfect. I, I noticed that anytime it's the final call, there's usually some questions always because it is always one more. Yeah, for yep. sure. Thank you so much. So next week we will have Martin uh, Wimpress presenting building, analyzing, optimizing, and securing containerized apps. So thank you for joining us today and see you next week. Thank you, everyone.